2021, and we are here in the National Bar Association conference room. I'm Jimmy Lynn Ramsour, and I get the pleasure of interviewing and, and hearing the oral history of Bill Purcell, uh, which is fascinating. Good afternoon, Bill. Good afternoon, Jimmy Lynn. It's good to be with you. How are you? I'm good. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Good. It's, it's been a while since we talked, and I, I think it should be fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to it also. So I know the answers to a lot of these questions, but obviously this is for the rest of the world. So tell us a little bit about your background. Where were you born? And tell us about your parents. Sure. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My mother had grown up in Louisiana, in Faraday, Louisiana, actually, a little town uh, on, the, uh, on the Mississippi River. Uh, she uh, had come there with her father, who took a church, the First Baptist Church of Faraday, Louisiana. It's a small town. From that town, my mother, her brother, Jimmy Swagger, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, J just a, quite a group of people, all of whom uh, left that town. My mother to go first to college in Texas, then to get her a master's degree in speech and communications from LSU. She was 21. She wanted to teach at the college level. She was a champion debater, actually. I'm very proud of her success in the years 1946 and 47 nationally as a Debater and Temple University. You must University. have inherited some of her talent. Well, I don't know, but I, I think she, uh, she inspired me throughout my life, especially as to talking. So I, she found herself in Philadelphia. She met my father there. They fell in love, uh, got married, uh, and I was their first child. Grew up outside of Philadelphia. My father worked in the city as a food broker. I went off to college at Hamilton College. Uh, which was a great place to go to college and, and a great place that? for me. It's in upstate New York, Clinton, New York, outside of Utica. Uh, and a terrific place then and a better place since I got out of the way. It has, it has like many of our schools, done much better uh, after we left. Uh, but I was cold. I was cold uh, the whole time. My mother told me to put on a, another coat, but uh, that didn't seem to solve the problem. I was cold. I wanted to go to law school. And I came to Vanderbilt, and that made all the difference. So you went to law school at Vanderbilt. What year did you graduate? I graduated in 1979. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. What inspired you to go to law school? Well, at that time, when I started college, I didn't have a, a, a clear sense, like many of us, maybe most of us in those days. Uh, but during I think the time, that's still true. <laughs> well, I I, I think uh, college had an, a focusing effect for most of us. Uh, at least that was the goal. And in my case, I developed a feeling during the time I was in college that I wanted to be helpful to people, to people who needed me, uh, and the skill that I felt I could apply most successfully was law. That was based upon very little experience and even less knowledge. Did you have any lawyers in your family? Not in my close-in family. I had a, a, an uncle, actually a cousin, John Reed, who uh, was a law professor uh, at the University of Michigan for many, many years. Uh, and uh, also a dean at Wayne State and also, also at Colorado. Uh, and, and he was in many ways uh, clearly a supporter, uh, a believer in legal education. Uh, and that may have had more of an effect at the time than I realized. It had a great effect later on as I was thinking about law schools, as I was thinking about how to be a lawyer. John Reed was, a, was an early and lifelong inspiration for me. In what way? Uh, he, he had a sense of the higher calling of the law. He, he for many years, led the barristers, uh, literally up until his death, which is not but a few years ago now. Uh, and in that, in that position, and frankly, in his work at Michigan and other places, uh, he had a sense that we weren't just a profession, but we were called to be more, and that we were called uh, uh, individually and collectively to elevate our own practice and ultimately to be a force for good in the world. That much... Uh, he articulated uh, to me throughout my, both my training and, and the rest of my life, and, and I believed him, and I still do. Did you enjoy law school? Uh, not uh, at first, for sure. Uh, I, as a first-year law student, found myself largely disoriented in a place where everyone else seemed to be oriented. Uh, I was not as enamored of contracts as perhaps uh, my professors uh, had hoped I would be initially. Uh, but I will say that I found the Vanderbilt Legal Aid Society. Now we think of it as the clinic. Uh, but the Legal Aid Society was a place where there were people very focused on trying to help people and using their legal training skills and, and their uh, 
heart to make a difference for, in my case, mostly kids, but also for families that were in need. And in that context, the rest of it suddenly uh, became clear to me uh, that the education was all a part and a piece of this licensure and understanding, and that there was right in front of me the opportunity to make a difference. And that clinical experience, that legal aid society experience, really, uh, I think, grounded me and ultimately inspired me, not just to, to enjoy law school more, which I did, uh, but then ultimately to uh, to the careers that I've had. What kind of cases did you handle in the legal clinic? They sent us, uh, me in, in particular, uh, to uh, a place called Spencer Youth Center. Uh, there was a great interest in the, the then leader of the of the clinic, David Kozlowski, uh, in, uh, in juvenile law, in juvenile conditions. Uh, and so I found myself very early in my first year uh, sitting with... Uh, individuals who had been convicted of or found to have committed juvenile delinquency uh, and been sent away from their homes, from their counties, in many cases many miles away from their homes uh, and their families, uh, in order to uh, attend a training school, which we would have previously called a reform school. Uh, and because it was in the Department of Corrections, you might think of as a prison for kids. Uh, conditions were not good. Uh, due process was the exception. Uh, and uh, outcomes were poor. But we had a chance to, to address those, initially under the supervision, obviously, of lawyers in, in the clinic, and then ultimately under the third year practice rule. And so uh, within that time frame, there was an ability to, again, to change the course uh, of, uh, of uh, the life of a, of a person who had no one but us to do that. And that. Uh, that, that was a, it was an early and important inspiration for me. And aside from the legal clinic, did you have a particular professor that inspired you? You know, I, I have to say that Vanderbilt at that time had, had uh, still had uh, uh, some of the best in the world, John Wade, for example, who, uh, who made me care about torts. Uh, since I hadn't known even what a tort was, it was, it was a long stretch to get from understanding it and caring about it, but he did. Uh, I do think Don Hall, uh, in his focus on criminal law, maybe he, he was infamous in town in, in his uh, good works. He was. Don Payne was my teacher for evidence and inspired me in that field, my uncle's chosen field for teaching. And uh, I, I'd have to say across the board, there was a group that was, some of whom had been there a long time, many of whom had just come in under Dean Knauss. And ultimately, I had uh, exactly what I needed when I needed it and enough flexibility to choose the things that I most wanted to do. So did the legal clinic um, or other experiences, what did, how did that impact your decisions on what you wanted to do after law school? Well, in that process, I, I found myself clerking during the course of my second year summer uh, as a full-time employee of the, of the clinic. Uh, and then we continued to do work, uh, actual re representation and arguments in chancery court uh, about around due process issues for That must have been very kids. exciting for a law school. It, it was absolutely uh, transformative. Uh, it, it, it was immediate proof that a lawyer, the law, a good judge, a good chancellor, an honorable and honest venue, uh, and, and the facts understood uh, that you could in an instant change the world, at least the world of your client. Uh, and that, that came to me in, 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 in that time and inspired me uh, to apply to be a legal services lawyer, and that was, uh, I, I applied several places, and uh, the place that seemed most uh, attractive at that time, or most interesting, most appealing, was uh, rural West Tennessee, and so I went off after the third year, after I graduated, to uh, West Tennessee Legal Services in Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, did, I think you met somebody pretty important to you in Jackson, did you not? Well, I did. I was representing kids. The, the then county judge, Walter Baker Harris, was kind enough to welcome uh, legal services. In fact, was, what, what, was he an influence on you too? He I, was. He was. He was. He was an early model of a of a judge, not just a rural judge or a, or a small city judge, but a judge who cared uh, about the law and cared about the people who, who were in front of him and really believed that he should try to find uh, the representation that that individual needed. Rural West Tennessee had had frankly not been. Uh, encouraging to legal services. When I arrived there, the, the rural West Tennessee was the largest area of America without legal services. Legal services was already present in Guam, Puerto Rico, Micronesia, Alaska, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia. 
Were the lawyers in Jackson welcoming to you? You know, I would say that they had not initially, and for a number of years after other places, understood the need for a federal legal services program. But once we arrived uh, in 78 and 79, uh, I would say, uh, led in part by our first board chair, Mary Jo Middlebrooks, who continues to be an inspiration to the Madison County Bar. I went to high school Did you really? Yes. Well, Mary Jo Middlebrooks was, uh, was the person on point for legal services, together with a number of other lawyers. And in the end, I'd have to say pretty quickly, uh, both the, uh, the bar, broadly, the judges uh, uh, specifically, even the non-lawyer judges, which in those days were quite, uh, quite, uh, quite special because there were quite a few non-lawyer judges. County judges were, did not have to be lawyers. County judges had jurisdiction over probate, uh, over uh, uh, children. Uh, and uh, in the words of the statute, I think still at that time, idiots and imbeciles, which is, of course, offensive beyond belief now, but what the law said. And that's, uh, that jurisdiction meant in a General Sessions Court, and by and large, outside of the larger places, non-lawyer judges. But I think, in short order, the, the, the people involved in the legal system in, in West Tennessee came to see not only was justice improved, but Honestly, the whole working of the system improved when there were r good lawyers or, or co competent at least and, and engaged lawyers on both sides of the equation. The system has a chance to succeed. The system has a chance to, to resolve itself in the way it's supposed to. And in that process, uh, West Tennessee Legal Services, which initially was its five counties, found itself granted the... Uh, uh, the jurisdiction to, to, to represent all of rural West Tennessee, from Lake to, to uh, Henry and Benton, Benton all the way down the river uh, to Hardin, Hardin then all the way west to Hardeman, uh, and then back up on the, on the western side to Haywood and, and, and Dyer and the rest, everything in between. That's a huge area. It's a so large you were traveling area. around a lot. We did, and then ultimately we established offices. Uh, we had satellite offices, one in Dyersburg, one in Huntington, and one in Selmer. We hired more lawyers. And we suddenly had a large rural uh, law firm practice over the over all of those counties, and uh, and it was it was one of the uh, frankly one of the early most satisfying experiences of my life to to be the first legal services lawyer in a place was uh, a special uh, challenge in a way I suppose, but also uh, th there was a certain amount of uh, anxiety, but mm -hmm. to for at the end to to watch the transformation. Of the, of the people in the system. The clerks all were welcoming. They knew, the clerks as always knew, in many cases earlier than the lawyers did, how much better life would be if there were lawyers actually on all sides of the equation. They were welcoming. Uh, we, were, we were considered equal members of the bar. And, uh, and, and I think a lot of justice was done, especially in, in family relations and family matters, where there just simply hadn't been lawyers helping, in particular, women who found themselves in abusive or harmful relationships. So that was an exciting time. And I, did you say, did we talk about your meeting your wife there? Well, you were leading into that. Right, and then we kind of got off track and yeah. talked about the inspiring work yeah. you were doing. Well, I was in juvenile court quite a lot, and uh, sometimes my uh, client was not, not, sometimes my client actually did what he or she was accused of. And sometimes that meant that the judge had to make a determination that they could not stay at home. Uh, in the state of Tennessee at that time, as I alluded to earlier, uh, there were state institutions and they were by and large uniformly places that would not meet constitutional muster today for most purposes. They were part of the Department of Corrections. They were run by adult correctional staff who had been transferred or started in the juvenile division. Uh, and they, some were not good and others were much worse. Uh, but in this case, West Tennessee, Jackson in particular, Madison County, had established its own, uh, its own very special group home. Uh, and it really was. It was a place Walter ba Baker had seen the need and, and found the resources, some of them federal, some of them local, to take over a part of the old Union University campus and create uh, a group home for young people. And that group home uh, was the place where I if my, if my client couldn't stay at home, then the place I wanted him or her to go was the Madison County Group Home. That meant, of course, that I needed to go as their lawyer and negotiate about conditions and release and, and family visitation. And that meant negotiating with the people who ran the Group Home and the woman who ran the Group Home, a woman named Debbie Miller, 
turned out to be, uh, I just thought, the best person in West Tennessee. Well, apparently uh, she was, because eventually you all got married. Eventually we fell in love. We dated for, uh, for a while, and then uh, we, were, we were married uh, here in Nashville. So you didn't stay in Jackson for a long time. You, um, you moved to Nashville. I did. I really what had caused you to have to do that? You know, I, I had left Nashville not necessarily thinking I would come back. Um, I'd been here for law school. I'd done things that I, I was thankful for and appreciative of. Uh, but Debbie got a job in Nashville uh, with uh, some other individuals, who uh, some lawyers, Linda O'Neill, May Shane, uh, and others, Linda Matson. Uh, they had begun a nonprofit called the Institute for Children's Resources. Their purpose was to move Tennessee from last in America in the incarceration of kids in adult jails. Basically, Tennessee and many places, if you were picked up for truancy, if you were picked up for uh, uh, any status offense or a criminal offense, uh, and you needed to be detained even for a short while, uh, you, the detention typically took place outside of the major cities in, in the adult jails of our counties. These women uh, had determined that this was wrong, and they were right, and that we, they, they would lead the way uh, in the state of Tennessee to change that. So while I was over uh, as a legal services lawyer, Debbie and, and the others were here going county to county, frankly changing the climate around this issue. Uh, and it was, it was not at its core a legal issue. Uh, it was a policy issue that had law all around it. And they, in a very short period of time, and I'm so proud of this. I, 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 it, it, it's, I'm proud of her, and I'm proud of them. But I'm also, I, I, I tell this story because it's a reminder that a few people who are committed to the right thing, lawyers or not lawyers, but within the legal system, can change the world if they are, if if it's the right thing to do. So within a short period of time, uh, literally less than three years, they had uh, turned us uh, turned us around. We were we went from worst in America to best in America. Uh, they went from county to county, sheriff to sheriff. Uh, providing alternatives, options, resources, and ultimately we, we, we were transformed in that process. In, in, during this time, uh, I, I, I was in my office in Jackson, Tennessee, when then public defender Walter Kurtz stopped in my office without an appointment or warning. There was no cell phone. I don't think there, I know there was no internet, uh, but there were telephones, and he might have called or sent a letter or a telegram or something, but he didn't. He just walked into my office in Jackson, Tennessee and said, uh, hello, would you like to be a public defender in Nashville? And I thought to myself, that's not exactly what I was thinking about doing today. I was thinking about divorcing someone. But I said to him, well, when would this be? And he said, well, probably two weeks. I'm running for judge, and I need to fill out the employment in my office before this judicial campaign begins, and uh, what do you say? And I thought about Debbie in Nashville. I thought about the Greyhound bus that I'd been taking back and forth, sometimes the trailways, but they really weren't much different from Jackson to Nashville. And I thought about the criminal law and uh, my interest in it, and I said yes. I might need a month, but I'll come. Was that a life-changing experience? It really it truly was. It, 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 it fit, in retrospect, ideally with the experiences that I'd already had representing poor people, indigent people in civil matters. Now I was on the criminal side. Uh, and so the, the combination together uniquely gave me, I think, an exposure to and an understanding of, of all that the law did with people. But uh, it was also transformative because it put me uh, in Nashville, a place I was not sure was my future, and then did one more thing. It put me in the jail, put me inside the jail, uh, and inside the penitentiary and inside the, the correctional facilities and the correctional system of Tennessee. Uh, and the combination of those experiences, uh, for me, from a policy standpoint, uh, made, um, made an enormous difference. And so was that uh, easy work or not so easy work? Well, one of the things that anyone who was a public defender knows is that it is, and, uh, and let me say, for the record, of course, Jimmy Lynn Ramser arrived in that same office in that same job, basically. We together in tandem. We did. I was hired and you were hired, I believe, shortly thereafter. Uh, and uh, the work uh, was, uh, well, we had the same job. We just had <laughs> alternate weeks. I would go into the jail for a week, typically before the sun came up, leaving after the sun went down. Uh, that was for a week, Monday through Friday. And then that public defender 
would move to the bond docket, and, and my partner, uh, the person who had that position with me, would come down to the jail and spend the next week in the jail, and I would hand my files off to you uh, and then uh, head up to the bond docket. The bond docket in those days, it's, it's hard for, for people to, these are individuals who are on bond in General Sessions Court facing criminal charges, all of them. Uh, they have typically, more of them have private counsel than one on the jail docket where they couldn't make bond. But on the, uh, on the bond docket, the public defender was responsible for three dockets. You answered the call of the 9 o'clock docket, you answered the call of the 9.30 docket, and then you answered the call of the 1 o'clock docket. And again, it was pretty much from the first thing in the morning to the last of the day. So it, it was, was busy time. It was busy. It was challenging because it's people's lives, uh, their freedom, their future. Uh, everything about them is there at risk, even on the smallest criminal case. Uh, so that's, that makes it obviously um, uh, both important and difficult, challenging and stressful. Uh, but also, again, uh, then and now, among the most rewarding things any lawyer could ever do, because you're representing people who, who need you and don't have anyone else, and, and you are the person between them uh, and the most awful possible consequences imaginable, especially uh, where, uh, for whatever reason, uh, justice is not evident to the trier of fact or the prosecutor. Any uh, interesting stories you have that you want to tell about the public defender's office time? You know, it, it's... Uh, Are there too many to tell? Well, I think all of us as public defenders have, have uh, cases that are, that, are, uh, that are different from, <laughs> uh, from things we may have done later in life. I can tell you my first jury trial was defending an individual who found himself... Uh, uh, on the wrong side of the checkout line in Bill Crook's food town in Clark, on Clarksville Pike with a, not a large, sort of a medium-sized rump roast up under his, up <laughs> under his coat. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, truthfully, as I explained to the jury, it could really have happened to anyone. You know how you get in the grocery store and just get sort of disoriented and confused <laughs> and other things come to mind or you remember something in the car or for whatever reason, uh, you're, just, you're just not where you're supposed to be. And uh, it appeared to the management of the store that he had, was attempting to take that rump roast, but... Uh, and he was arrested for that. Uh, and it was uh, my first jury trial, and it was also Judge Randall Wyatt's first jury trial. And I will say that I, I, I have a distinct memory of a new judge just having been elevated to the criminal court bench, coming out and taking his seat and having a look of satisfaction and joy, really, that he'd accomplished now that thing that he had sought all of his life, because Randall really had wanted to be a judge, and he wanted to be a judge in criminal court, in that particular criminal court. And there he was. And in the most uh, majestic way possible, he looked down at me, whom he knew from the jail docket. We'd both been there before. And he said, Mr. Purcell, can you tell me what this case is about? And I can remember standing with as much authority as I had to say, Your Honor, this is about the theft of a rump roast from Bill Crook's food town. The look on Randall's face when he <laughs> thought, I spent my whole life all my energy directed to come up here to, to have the great cases of our time and day. And this is it. And I'm starting with a rump, co rump roast at Bill Crook's Food Town. He said, how long will it take? I said, oh, no more than two days, I'm sure. And we tried the case for two days. And thankfully, the jury understood that this really could happen to anyone. And uh, Michael was acquitted. Oh, wow. And I've never heard from him again, so I assume it's... He must have gone down the right path after I, that. I, I, no I, more I, rump roasts in his coat. Well, I think certainly not on the wrong side of the checkout. That's great. How long were you in the public defender's office? I was there for three and a half years, which at that time was, oh, maybe a little bit, maybe a little more than average. Uh, some people stayed longer, but it was, uh, three and a half years was perceived by me and I think by others as a, as a pretty long run as yeah, a Yeah, only made defender. it two, so... Others, others have stayed longer, and especially as more resources and, and the workload has been more, I think, uh, easily shared across a larger office, perhaps, uh, more, uh, people stay longer. But I, it, it was the right amount of time from my perspective. I got to try every kind of case and see every kind of judge in every kind of courtroom uh, and try, uh, uh, try things that, um, that nowadays uh, still inform me in, in terms of the courts and the law and people. And how, where did you go after the public defender's office? I went to private practice uh, with a group of criminal defense lawyers, many of whom were uh, 
like me, former public defenders. And legendary, Lion really. Yeah, well, Lionel Barrett, certainly. He, it was his law firm, and Lionel Barrett was an utterly legendary criminal defense lawyer, both for his skill in the courtroom and his integrity. And, uh, and Lionel had attracted to, to join him there Bill Reddick, uh, as well as then Rich McGee, uh, and uh, uh, Sumter Camp, now a federal public defender, uh, and Al Cock. Uh, it, was a, it was a group of lawyers that I knew and knew well and, and who... All, all excellent lawyers. Well, Rich continues to, to be in private practice to this day, uh, and uh, it, was a, it was a good group and, again, a good introduction to, to private practice and the complexities of attempting to, uh, to b both assess the value of a case and the ability of a client to fulfill that value. So um, now you, um, at some point, decided to run for office. I did. I did. When I, was that? It was in 1986. Uh, I, uh, at that time, it was working with Lionel uh, over on 3rd Avenue. And, and, did this uh, just come to you, or did somebody approach you? No, I, I, that's a good question. Uh, no, I had never imagined being in the state uh, legislature uh, ever, not for, not for a moment. But I was a member of a neighborhood in East Nashville, and my neighborhood uh, association leaders came to see me, and they said, our uh, state representative has just been elected the county clerk, and the position will open. There will be an election this summer, and we'd like you to run for the legislature. And I said, I've never been to the Capitol. And they said, you're perfect. We'll send you. They, I realized later, had all been to the Capitol and had no desire whatsoever to go. And They, they knew better than you did. Well, perhaps. They said, um, do you have a conflict of any kind? And I said, well, I don't think so. I'm getting married on... August the 9th, when is the election? And they said, August the 7th. And I said, that seems to me as though that's not a <laughs> conflict. But I will talk to my fiancée, my wife now, Debbie, and see what she says. She said, well, why would you want to go up there? She made, Wise woman. She'd been to the legislature, just as they had. And she, saw, she had certainly no desire to go to the legislature. And I said, well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer, and I know a little more than I did about laws policy, kids, maybe I could make a difference. And a, a very long story uh, how hard it had been to work with me in planning this wedding, but compressed, she said, here's the deal. If you'll have nothing more to do with the wedding, you run for the legislature. I will come to your election day party on Thursday, and then you will come to the uh, rehearsal dinner on Friday, and then to the wedding on Saturday, and that's, if that's a deal, that's what we'll do. And so I ran for the legislature, and she took care of the wedding. And uh, I was elected. And both were successful. I was elected on that Thursday. It would have been, frankly, a less joyous wedding if it hadn't worked out that way. So <laughs> I don't recommend doing scheduling things like this back to back. But we had a much larger reception as a result of having won the election than I would have had otherwise. And, uh, and I went off to the legislature in 1986. So you went from, from one interesting group of characters of people you represented in the public defender's office to another interesting group of characters in the legislature. And did you have some meeting, like the first meeting you ever went up on the Hill? Was there uh, something interesting about that? I arrived in the, in the, uh, in the House leadership elections literally uh, just days after, after the general election. And at that time, the caucuses uh, choose the, the leaders. The majority caucus chooses the speaker and the speaker pro tem and the other offices. And so I, I, I remember distinctly sitting there thinking, I'm in the legislature and we're electing the leaders. This is quite special. And the speeches were made and the speaker was nominated and the speaker pro tem and the caucus chairman. And, and at, at some point, uh, they said, and now we're going to elect the new majority whip. And I turned to the person next to me and said, I didn't know we had a majority whip. And that person said, we didn't. And I said, well, why are we going to have one now? He said, because we have a very good person for the job. I said, that's great. Where is he? And he said, well, he's in prison. <laughs> but don't worry, he'll be out in time for session. And then I heard someone say, and so it's unanimous. And I thought, you know, honestly, I've only been here a few minutes, and I've already voted for someone in prison for a position that I didn't even know existed. And I wasn't sure then exactly what the future would be. How'd that work out? Well, he turned out to be quite a good majority whip. It's uh, Tommy Burnett, right? Yes, and a member of the Tennessee Bar and, uh, and, and a great lawyer in many ways and certainly an outstanding legislator. But uh, it was a difficult time in the legislature for many reasons. 
I didn't know that. It wasn't at all foreseeable to me. But within the next uh, two terms, uh, the chairman of the state and local government committee killed himself. Uh, the Secretary of State of Tennessee killed himself. The FBI arrived in the state capitol. Was there a connection between those two? There, all of these were all part of the, of the, of the FBI coming uh, into the capitol to determine uh, that, uh, that there was a considerable amount of criminal activity around uh, the, uh, the subject of bingo, but things that were related to it as well. Uh, and so uh, there were a number of arrests, uh, a number of, uh, in fact, uh, the majority whip, having passed the Criminal Sentencing Reform Act of 1989, I think two weeks later went back to prison for the second time. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a very difficult time in Tennessee, uh, certainly in state government, uh, and I determined that I would either be a leader or I would leave. This was not the place either my mother or my fifth grade teacher had had suggested the legislative body might be. So uh, in 1990, I, I ran for majority leader. There were going to be new leaders elected in the House. And, so you'd uh, only been in for four years at this I, point. This was, my, this was my second term. And um, and I set out to to attempt to, to be elected to that position, campaigned within the, the, uh, the majority caucus for that. Uh, and uh, in that, at the end of that year, then 1990, uh, a new speaker, Jimmy Nafee, was elected. Uh, Lois DeBerry, uh, who is our great ally and friend, uh, and a terrific, wonderful leader. Uh, Lois DeBerry became the speaker pro tem, and I became the majority leader of the Tennessee House. Uh, it really wasn't on my mind at that time that there'd never been one from a city before Nashville or another city. And I certainly, up now, I was pretty sure nobody from Philadelphia had ever been asked for this position. But the members of the caucus. I think we're together about the fact that we'd been through a dark time, we'd been through a difficult time, and, and it needed to be, it needed to change. And, and as a result of that, with the leadership of Ned McWhorter, the governor, uh, and uh, the Senate and House together, over the next four years, we went from all those things I described to being the best managed state in America for two, uh, two years in a row. We were recognized as a legislature that was among the most successful in the country. And again, a reminder to me and, and hopefully to others that you can go from the darkest times uh, in policy and politics, and in short order, if there is agreement, a consensus, at least a, a strong majority view, you can, you can move from the worst to the best. And, and you can actually legislate. And yes, yes. Do and some good for the public. Yes, and you can do so on a bipartisan basis, which in general almost always was the way we proceeded. It doesn't mean that there weren't disagreements, but by and large, things were decided based upon people's own views. Uh, and while we might have uh, not everyone all together, uh, it wasn't because you, you were a D or an R. Uh, it was because you just disagreed. Okay, fine. And the next issue you could agree. And the, and the one after that, you could disagree again, and then you could come together and agree again. But ultimately, we came out from underneath the control of the federal courts in the prisons. We came out from underneath the oversight of the state courts in education. We transformed and, and, and really worked hard and, and, and made a significant difference in juvenile policy and in those awful facilities that I'd seen at Vanderbilt uh, all those years before, and not that many years before, really not more than a decade before. And all of a sudden, you were, you, you, it was clear to me, as I think it was to the people of Tennessee, that uh, we, we can go from not good to good, from worse to best. We can do it quickly if we just, if we just want to. Well, so you also had um, uh, something to do with uh, the voting uh, situation in Tennessee. Did you pass some legislation regarding that? Yeah, this was, this was a time in, at which is... Uh, it's, it's interesting how, how the world turns, if you will. Uh, yeah, we, we were very interested in improving access uh, to, to uh, voting for people. It was, it, was, uh, it was an interest that we shared, I thought. Uh, and so we pursued in, in, in that time uh, two initiatives. And this would be in the, in the, uh, the year 1994, as I recall. We pursued uh, both motor voter a principle that had been around for a while and is now really uh, universal across the country, but at that time was not. Motor voter is simply a, another way of saying when you go to get your driver's license, you have an opportunity to register to vote. It's the kind of thing that we now take absolutely for granted, but was considered controversial because it would indeed increase registrations. 
And the second was a much newer idea that really was uh, not, it, it was not exclusive to Tennessee, but Tennessee was among the earliest to consider it, and that was uh, early voting. We had always had the traditional method of voting on election day. Uh, polls open on you know seven in the morning, close at seven at night. That's it. But the you either budget, make it or you don't. That that's day. it. That's all. Snow comes, tornado. Sick in the hospital. It doesn't matter. Whatever you don't. You, that's right. But uh, but the idea of early voting, which came from the registrars, from the professional election officials, was pretty simple and straightforward. If it was revolutionary in, in our thinking, which was there's no reason that you can't open the polls 20 days before the election. Keep them open for 15 days. And then whoever hasn't been able to vote in that time could vote on election day. And we still do that in Tennessee. That's yes, we absolutely do that. It's a gift you gave us that we're still enjoying. Well, I, honestly, it was, it was transformative, but not in the ways that people thought. It, there was nothing, in the end, partisan about it. Nothing small p political about it. What happened was that, first of all, more people could vote, particularly people that, for whatever reason, were limited by age, health, employment, economic status, whatever. The things that had kept people from just Or even those people who were out of town traveling right, or... Right, right, and, and especially people that couldn't take off on a Tuesday mm -hmm. but could come in on a Saturday. Uh, families, it, it, for, it, was, it was just good for everyone. And it had also a positive effect on elections because of, in history, and it's worth saying this out loud, when there's an election just on one day, there is a very high uh, uh, inducement to attempt to introduce information into the electorate very close in time to the election, which may or may not be true, not just here but across the country. Because you know, the, there, there's a, especially before the Internet and the kind of electronic communication we have now, there was an, there was an, an, an absolute advantage if you could communicate a giant lie 48 hours before an election into the mailboxes of a significant number of people, there was no time for the opponent to respond. Same thing could happen. No fact-checking, basically. No, basically. No, well, no, and no chance for the other side to respond. Same thing on television. You, you know, you, if you could run a negative ad the night before the election, there was no time for there to be response. Bottom line, what early voting did, and still does to this day, is make it, make it easier for everybody. It's not, again, nothing to do with... with uh, Democrats or Republicans. No, it's nothing partisan about it whatsoever. It absolutely... And in fact, in the year 1994, when this was passed, uh, I remember very, very, very well that it was among the best years the Republican Party ever had in the state of Tennessee until recent years because, in the end, it advantaged good candidates and good right. campaigns. So uh, you also passed a maternity leave bill, I think? Well, one of the early initiatives that I undertook, and, and I think one of the things that, that kept me... Um, confident about the ability of a legislature to change things was was maternity leave. This, this was not something that we had in America. We now think of the Family and Medical Leave Act as a kind of a constant, but it wasn't. The federal government had, had not been able or willing to implement it. And Tennessee, again, uh, one of the first states, not the first, but one of the first states, uh, was, I thought, a place that would be open to it. And with the help of a large number of people in both parties, in both houses, and the governor of Tennessee, we passed one of the first maternity leave acts uh, in the country to, to basically say that, that women should not have to choose between um, taking care of their child for a few months uh, or their jobs. Uh, that if we really cared about kids, we'd, we'd, we'd give them the option to have their, their parents both home and then employed. So these are all very progressive uh, ideas and, and things that you were able to do. Uh, were these done only with Democrats? How did you do that? Now, with the exception of those voting bills I described, there was not one bill in 10 years that passed in the Tennessee House strictly on party lines. And I, I, I'll say it again, for 10 years, uh, basically, whatever the issue, the budget, redistricting, Choose your subject. Uh, we did not pass things in that House strictly on partisan lines. Uh, this, of course, is now kind of unbelievable, I suppose, to people who, who look at the Congress, for example. The times are different. Yeah. Well, they may be, but I can tell you this. Uh, when, there is, when there is consensus and bipartisan conversation, debate, discussion, argument, that's okay, just like courts. It's fine. You can argue. Uh, you can do it civilly, but you can argue. You can argue emotionally. 
But at the end of the day, when, when people of, of, of good will and good conscience with, with the desire to improve the state and help people and lift it up come together uh, in a majority that cuts across the usual boundaries, especially partisan political boundaries, but also regional and, and rural and urban boundaries, that's when, that's when states begin to, to, to soar. And I'm hopeful that this will come to people again. So how long were you majority leader? I was majority leader six years. And during that time, were you practicing law? Well, I, I yes, I was. <laughs> Probably <laughs> I was, not a lot. I was a licensed like attorney. I kept my license. Well, I, I will say, and this is this is the challenge for lawyers in public service. It was then, it is now, uh, and and it's many members of the Nashville bar, very frankly, have worked over time to try to find ways to encourage lawyers. There was a time, as we all I think know, when the major. Uh, uh, the two groups most represented in legislatures here and across the country were farmers and lawyers. Farmers and lawyers because basically the, the legislative session allowed them to, uh, uh, to, to, to be in the state capitol uh, before planting season, mm -hmm. for example, in the case of farmers. And in the case of lawyers, typically they had, you know, we had terms of court and lawyers in, in Tennessee had an, an automatic legislative exemption, which was an adva one advantage to being a lawyer legislator is that you could pass your case from term to term. And well, usually you only missed a term because That's the right. legislature didn't meet that for no. that long. And, I mean, in the early, in, in most, for most of the state's history, it meant only every other year. Uh, but so it was lawyers and farmers. But as time went on, and, uh, and frankly, lawyers found themselves uh, unable uh, to give up that much time uh, and, and this, of course, has gotten only worse in that regard. Uh, you know, that, I, I say all that to say there is, there is a need for us to continue to think about how we as a profession can make it possible, easier, uh, for our members to participate in public service. Uh, there is no easy answer. If there was, we would have already done it. But it is going to take the concerted effort of the Nashville, the Tennessee, and the, frankly, American bar writ large uh, to, to do that. Otherwise, uh, it, it is unthinkable to me to imagine uh, uh, legislatures without lawyers. Yes, they have their own staff lawyers. Yes, there are attorneys general. Yes, there are other folks. But to not have lawyers in the Judiciary Committee, in the Commerce Committee, lawyers who are participating from the perspective that something is genuinely lost in that process. And so it's, it's a challenge to us all to to make it possible for lawyers. And they have to understand, as I did, that the further along I would go, I would, if I moved up in uh, position, my Social Security wages would probably <laughs> decline. Right. But okay, you know, uh, that comes with it too. It's, you're not there uh, to make money. Those that thought they were there to make money, many of them were the people the FBI was most inter were most interested in. So did you have uh, any interesting stories from campaigning when you were in the legislature? or? Oh, I, you know, it, it, particularly if you're if you're in the leadership, speaker, majority leader, in one of those, you campaign uh, you campaign just about anywhere because mm -hmm. you're trying to help not only yourself be reelected, but right. you're trying to help your colleagues right. be reelected as well. So I've I've campaigned in in most every county of the state at one time or another. Uh, I've campaigned in certainly every large city at one time or another. Probably the most peculiar place uh, was uh, was uh, campaigning in Brushy Mountain Prison. Uh, where um, not with the prisoners, of course. No, the prisoners, of course, had all lost their, their <laughs> right. rights to vote. There is obviously an, a, there's an effort underway to, to in some ways, uh, refine that uh, disqualification or disability. But no, in, th in those days, certainly every you, when you were convicted of a felon felony, you lost your right to vote as well as your right to carry arms. No, but in Brushy Mountain Prison, the guards were were important uh, voters, yeah. and they were organized in a union which was illegal then and now, but they were organized nonetheless at Brushy Mountain. So I can remember going with the uh, state legislators there to campaign amongst the, uh, the staff, the employees mm -hmm. of the Department of Corrections at uh, Brushy Mountain. That's among the most peculiar pl places I've ever campaigned, certainly. So why did you leave the state legislature? Well, you know, I'd been there 10 years, and, uh, and, and they were great years. They were a great time, not just here, but in the country, to be in state government. There had been a great change in the in the 70s and and into the 80s in terms of the federal government's role and and states were picking up a lot of the of the, of the uh, threads, if you will, or, or areas of responsibility, uh, and that that was true really across the country. So I, I I mean I was blessed to be there when I was there, 
But by 1996, I thought to myself and then out loud, I've been here 10 years. I've done really everything I could think to do and everything I wanted to do. We're in a good place as a state. I'm in a good place, uh, I think, as a, as a legislator and a lawyer, and I, I'm going to take what I know and, and do something else. So I announced that I, I would not run again and um, started a child and family policy center at Vanderbilt, remembering, as you do, that that's where I began mm -hmm. in the in the in the juvenile courts and the juvenile mm -hmm. um, going back to and, your roots, really. Yeah, and and I and I thought we had done a lot in Tennessee, and thankfully foundations agreed that we could share with other states, mm -hmm. and so I started out around the country talking to other state legislators and and policymakers about things we had done, things that we'd wanted to do, things that that they might consider as well, and and so for the next four years I did that. And what caused you to leave there? Well, I had a bit of an epiphany actually. Uh, I realized uh, that I is this your midlife crisis. No, no, no. It's just, it's just, a, it's just it's something that I, I realized I had been wrong. I had said repeatedly, without hesitation, that the one thing I knew that I did not want to be was the mayor, a mayor <laughs> or the mayor of Nashville. I knew that. I was certain of that. I, I had analyzed the subject. I had researched uh, the the trajectory of mayors in the world. And I knew that that was not where I would or could be. And said so whenever asked. As politicians, people will say, don't you want to be county clerk? Don't you want to be duke or earl or prince or princess? Wouldn't you like to do that? Which would and, be president? Yeah, or president or king or something. Don't you want to be something else? And But you want to run for uh, Congress? When they would say mayor, I would say, absolutely not. You should run for mayor. I have no interest in being mayor. But in my time moving around the country, talking about state policy, uh, two things became apparent to me. One uh, was that you could pass all the laws you wanted, but if those who were responsible for the funding and implementation of it uh, were not interested in doing so, uh, absent uh, litigation, which takes forever, successful resolution, and then ultimately some other force, judicial or otherwise, compelling uh, performance, that it would require, for the things I cared most about, local governments to lead the way. And the second thing that occurred to me is that, uh, that we were, I think, moving, as we had moved into a time of state leadership, we were moving into a time of local leadership. And I saw it in other cities, uh, in Philadelphia. You in, see this as sort of bottom up? In a way, <clears throat> uh, and, and it, but it, it, yes. And it mostly had to do with the fact that people uh, had begun to develop their own uh, consensus or understanding that there were many things they could not control. And you can think about those things now on the far side of the world, whether it's the Middle East or uh, other places, uh, where they as individuals could not necessarily direct the outcome or even know the outcome. But as to their education systems, their schools, as to their own public safety, as to their own quality of life, the things that happen at the local level, people, I think, Develop, were developing then and have now developed rather, I think, uh, broadly, a sense that about those things there should be both certainty and there should be action and there should be an expectation that those things will be done. So I felt that happening here uh, and saw it other places. And, uh, and so I simply first said to myself, you know, you've been wrong about this all along. And then I said it out loud that I would like to run for and be the mayor of Nashville, and so it's usually hard to admit that you're wrong. But apparently, you had no trouble after you thought through this. Well, I'm not sure that I led with that I've been wrong. I think I just led with I'd like to be the mayor, and I'd like to be your mayor, and I think there are things we could do together. And so I started probably a couple of years before the election, which was in uh, in uh, August of of 1999, uh, and began moving around the city of Nashville and saying just that. And in the end, I was successful. And, and happily so. I, mayor of Nashville, mayor of any major city, but I would say mayor of Nashville uh, is, is simply uh, the best job imaginable. Well, and it if was you, at an exciting time for Nashville, too. You no, know, it was. But it, 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 if you care about the things that I care about and that I think we as a bar care about, uh, then it, it's, the mayor can make those differences. Uh, you can you can you can have a direct impact not just on justice but on individuals' lives and neighborhoods, uh, and it, it it it's it's right there. And if a mayor wants to change that, a mayor can, mm -hmm. 
and uh, and thankfully I was allowed to. What was, where was the strangest place you campaigned when you were campaigning for mayor? That's a that's that's a hard one. I I mean I campaigned everywhere in this city. Uh, it's worth reminding people uh, that. This is the second largest city geographically in the continental United States. Jackson because Hill, it's the metropolitan. Yeah, because we have a consolidated yeah. government. Uh, we have uh, 533 square miles within the city of Nashville. Oh. Jacksonville is larger, but that's the only one. They're also consolidated. Uh, same population as Boston in the city, but they're 48 square miles, and we're 533 square miles. So it's a, it's a huge space. Uh, and um, I, I would say there is really no place in the county of Davidson that I uh, that I did not campaign then or or subsequently. Or later. Yeah, because the job of mayor is to be everywhere and hopefully think about and, and, and respond to the needs of everyone in the whole big city. What's the, uh, you think, your most important legacy? I, I should ask you, how long were you mayor? I was mayor for eight years, from 1999 so two terms. till 2007. There was, a dis frankly, a disagreement about the law in that regard. There was a feeling that there that a term limit provision uh, might apply to the mayor. Uh -huh. The legal department, then Carl Dean, said no. Uh, I was convinced that it did not apply to the mayor. But I also came to a conclusion, first personally, and then and then we did so legislatively, that two terms for a mayor was the right amount of time. Same as governor, same as president. But I, uh -huh. I, I, I don't think term limits for legislators makes much sense, um, at least not here. But I do think that for uh, for mayors, two two terms were sufficient. So we uh, we actually led I led my administration led away uh, the way to to amend the charter to make it abundantly clear two terms for the mayor. Uh, and so I I went out of office in 2007. And what would you say your legacy is? What would you like to think your legacy is as mayor? Well, I hoped, and I and and I believe that if I have a legacy, it is the thing that I most wanted to do. And that was for the city to, to agree about what's important for a city. And I believed then, and I believe as strongly or more strongly now, uh, that the most important thing a city does now, ever did, or ever will, is education. That's the most important thing we do. I, and, and, and I think of that, frankly, as, as lifelong, and in particular from our youngest to, to through our public schools. But uh, a city obviously has a role also encouraging higher education and other kinds of technical training. But educating and providing education that, that is available to everyone in the place mm -hmm. is the most important thing we ever did or ever will do. Uh, secondly, I um, was convinced and remain convinced, that, that, and it's a close second, that, that everybody has to be safe. The whole city has to be safe. Uh, when you and I started out as public defenders, I think there was a feeling here and in many places in America, as long as my neighborhood is safe, it's okay. And the news would say, well, in East Nashville last night, or in South Nashville last night, or in North Nashville last night, and the people who didn't live in those places would kind of go, well, not my neighborhood, I'm okay, everything's fine here. Some people even had gated areas where they could be doubly uh, carefully protected, they thought. But what was clear by the time I hope I left office is, and I think uh, that it was, if, if any part of the city isn't safe, ultimately you're not safe. Everybody has to be safe. Uh, and you have to have that assurance that, you, that that's your goal, that, that everybody, wherever they live, whatever their background or circumstances, that they're going to be uh, safe and that safety will be available to them. And then lastly, that, that, that quality of life, which you're right, has changed in Nashville dramatically during our time here. There, is, there are opportunities here for sports that obviously had never been imagined, opportunities in the arts, whether it's in country music or, or, or classical music or anything in between, African American music, rhythm and blues, jazz, choose your, choose your area of interest in music or general art, uh, whether it's ballet or the symphony, uh, green spaces, uh, bikeways, opportunities to be outside, individual, all those things, everybody feels differently about what gives quality of their life. But to have that broad cross-section of opportunities and have them available broadly across the city, that those, those are the critical things, education, safety, and quality of life. And I hope that my legacy will always be that when I left office and then after that, that people in Nashville about that agreed. We may not agree how to do each of those things, but we knew we had to. We might not agree whether we always had to, but we 
did agree, and I think we do agree. And each of the campaigns, by and large, since that time, successful campaigns for mayor, have made those points and cases. And I think that consensus to this day remains, and I hope it always will. So uh, we talked before, obviously, before today, and, and we talked a little bit about the uh, um, accomplishments, the physical sort of accomplishments. And can you, without, you don't have to go into great detail, but some list some of the things that you were able to do with your administration during well, that time? Well, I mean, obviously, every administration has, um, has other things that they sure. need to do and should do. And, and I, because I was so focused on neighborhoods, uh, I, I started there in many ways in thinking about education, improving schools, and, and, and repairing schools. We did a lot of investment in, in the physical plan of schools. I frankly thought that infrastructure then, I think again today, infrastructure of the city uh, is, is, is another critical element of success. So we began to both repair bridges and build new bridges. The, the uh, Korean Veterans War Bridge, uh, Veterans Bridge we think of, uh, was built with the, with the great collaboration of the state, the walking bridge, which we called Shelby, now called Siegenthaler, the Dumumbering Street Viaduct. We, we repaired and painted all of the bridges. We began to work broadly across the city on sidewalks. We had not been a city that believed particularly in walking, especially outside of the urban core. We began to build sidewalks in a way that we never had before, greenways, bikeways, and the like. Uh, and then broadening the investment in, in, in quality of life, so the Skirmahorn Center, uh, came along at this time with great city support, led by Martha Ingram, uh, a unique philanthropic contribution by Mrs. Ingram and her family, but the city as it was the second piece of that. The, the bringing people into the city, we had worked really hard and aggressively in Nashville to make sure that people didn't live in the city. We knew one thing, and that was that the problem with cities was people, and if you could get the people out of the city, that the city should do well. It was a wrong idea. We were absolutely wrong about this. When I became mayor in 1999, there were 900 people living uh, in the core of downtown Nashville in a city of 600, uh, over 600,000 people then, now 680, more to come with the new census, um, 900 people. Uh, that, that was wrong. So we began to invest in housing, incentivizing housing, affordable housing in particular. Here in the core, now they're approaching 15,000 people in the core, and there'll be more, many more in the core, as there should be in a dense city, in the center anyway. Uh, and then we began to push affordable housing across the city because back to quality of life, if you don't have a place uh, to live, you don't have quality of life. And if you don't have a place you can afford, then you won't have quality of life. And then on employment, we began to push hard, as sub subsequent mayors have and as my predecessors had, on economic development because the job is another piece of that. So we had and still, I think, have the, the record number for, of corporate headquarters relocations. We were number one in America for expansion and relocation of business. We were number one in America for, for corporate headquarters. And, the, and that expansion has continued to today, where it, we're now getting like a thousand, hundred people new every day coming to Nashville. I mean, it continues. When you're doing the right things as, as a city, people notice. You do those things, uh, then uh, people will come and people will stay. Uh, and, in, and in this case, uh, corporate headquarters are particularly valuable because they bring not just a, a, a factory, which is great, and jobs, which is important, but they also bring the, the profits and the opportunities that come from that. Every one of those corporate uh, uh, management teams said, we came not because of the incentives that were offered. The state gave us incentives, not the best, not the worst. Uh, we came not because the taxes are low. They are, but that's not why we came. Uh, we came uh, because we saw our future here. We saw this as um, uh, we saw this as the place that we, our spouses, our partners, our kids, our grandkids. We saw our future in Nashville. As long as people see their future and their family's future here, there's a reason for us to believe they will come, and they will stay, uh, and and that's what we that's what we want. So finally, another thing you did as mayor was um, the mayor's office was in the courthouse. And it was an old historic courthouse, and I believe you uh, did a lot to renovate the courthouse and maybe the public square. Was there an interesting story about oxygen? <laughs> yes. I, you know, you and I had sort of grown up in the courthouse, grown up certainly as litigators, uh, certainly as people in court. Absolutely. Uh, in, in, in the courthouse. So we knew it pretty well, places that... Oh, you know, uh, every nook and cranny. Yeah, most other lawyers would never see or know, right. like the old holding cells on the seventh floor and the... the uh, places people don't want to go. No, but we, we saw it all and knew it all. So I, I, I came into the courthouse <laughs> having a pretty good idea about the building and who was where and what. 
Uh, but not long after I got there, a judge came to see me uh, and sat down in my office and said, I was, I was actually kind of intrigued. and I'd never had a judge asked to come see me. Right. I'd always <laughs> been asked to come see them. But now I was the mayor, and here was a judge in my office. And he said, and I quote, well, he closed the door first, so it, was a little, it felt a little something special. Ominous. Yeah, ominous. He said, I think we're being poisoned. It was a long pause after that. I really wasn't, I hadn't anticipated he would say that. Uh, and I wasn't quite exactly sure what you were supposed to say after someone said that. But I said, well, Your Honor, that's not at all what I thought you would say. What makes you think that? He said, I just think it's a sick building. And I think that that's bad for all of us. And it's hurting all of us. And that's what I think. And I've been here a long time. I said, well, again, it's not what I was anticipating you would say, but I'm really glad to know that, and let me look about that. And I thought about it for a while, and I realized, in fact, that the building had not had much done to it since we had started out, and probably for a long time. So we hired the Siemens Company to come in and do a survey. The Siemens Company did a survey from the top of the building to the basement, uh, and came and gave a report. And the report was kind of remarkable. They said first in presenting it, we've never seen this. We've been in this business for more than a century. We started in Germany, but now we're here in America, and we have found something we've never found before. I said, well, please tell me. And they said, there is absolutely no place for fresh air to enter this building. This is the only building we've seen of this type and size where there is no place for fresh air to enter and no place for bad air to leave. And that is our finding and report. And I said, well, in a way, that's good news. And they said, how can that be? And I said, well, I think it sort of explains everything. Because all my life and before, people have been sitting at home saying to themselves and their families, how could they do that? How could they decide to do that? How could that be happening? How could the whatever in the courthouse? And the answer, of course, now is clear, which is since 1936 or so, there's been no oxygen in this building, or depleted oxygen has not been replaced. And having breathed the same air since that time period, we can now explain almost everything that people don't <laughs> like. But uh, having told me that, we'll fix it. So, you know, uh, and I think this is what, and, uh, particularly a lawyer, uh, who, who, like uh, the people in this bar who know how important that place is to everything that matters, um, that, that, that it, it, needed to be, it needed to be made right. So we began plans to, and ultimately funded, uh, the, we, we abandoned the courthouse for almost, I think, three years. Uh, we left, the courts went out to Metro Center, uh, the mayor went to the old Ben West Library, now an architectural office uh, up on Union, but the mayor's office moved there, the courts moved away. And everybody uh, continued to function despite that. Yes, yeah. yes. In fact, it's, just to, for the record, everyone said they didn't want to leave. Once they left and it was time to come back, they all said they didn't want to leave where they were. It's just people. And uh, in the end, after three years, we had not just uh, put oxygen back in the building and new air handling oh, systems and done the things that needed to be done to assure security of judges, which had been a real issue, frankly, uh, and, uh, and then created a public square for the first time. Uh, a space for people to gather and a space in front of a, I mean, cities need a public space that's shared for everyone. So we did all that, put parking underneath of it, and uh, had a great um, coming home, if you will. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to say I think that courthouse is held up and should always be uh, something we're proud of, whether you're in the city council or um, any of the courts there. We also built a criminal court because they're, one of the problems that they've been having was people uh, were, were jumping out of the windows on the sixth floor. And they, before I became mayor, having... Jumping out to escape, right? To escape, yeah, yes. Yeah. The, pr the prisoners were, on the sixth floor were the criminal courts, so the prisoners were uh, occasionally found to leap from the windows. And so to the, the, the city responded by cutting the trees down. They felt as though if they cut <laughs> the trees down, which the prisoners had been using to break, their, break fall, their fall, that they wouldn't leap. But indeed, they leapt anyway. So... Uh, it was pretty clear that the mixing of uh, criminals and an old historic building uh, was not uh, were, uh, was not a good idea. So we built a new criminal courts building and then uh, uh, moved those courts there into a more secure setting. And uh, frankly, the judges in both sets of courts had been riding up and down uh, with the people that they were about to judge, 
which is not an ideal recipe mm -hmm. for judicial independence or security. So anyway, we made those changes, and I think uh, in the end, uh, it's the kind of thing certainly that a lawyer mayor understands, but Nashville understood as well. I can't let our discussion pass without you uh, telling us about your reelection um, percentage. Well, people were very kind uh, to me. Uh, they were very well, I kind. I suspect it's because they thought you did a good job. Well, I, I don't know, but I, I was, it, it was, you know, when you run for re-election, you don't know. We'd had to raise revenue. We'd had to make lots of decisions, uh, and obviously people had, had, uh, had, had a chance to look and see, but I, I, they were very kind, and 84.8% and, um, uh, of the people. That's pretty incredible. Believe. Largest percentage ever, right? Well, it, it was. Uh, and, and, and it was great. It was very nice. People were very nice. So you've done this great job eight years as mayor, and you up and decide to leave Nashville. Where well, did you go? Well, I, I had an incredible offer, two, two that came close in time. Uh, and the first was from Harvard to go and be a fellow there. Uh, they have an institute of politics, and in that institute of politics they have fellows every year. Uh, and often uh, they had been uh, at least one of them from the local government. Uh, so they asked me to come and be a fellow, uh, and I was, it, it fit my schedule because it started in September and I knew I was going out of office then. Perfect. So I thought, that's good. That's a good thing to do. I'd be interested in that. I, it's true that I knew it was cold up there. I'd forgotten how cold <laughs> it was up there, but I went up there as a fellow. Uh, but about the same time, uh, Melvin Johnson, the president of Tennessee State University, had offered, uh, come to see me and said, I need someone to start a College of Public Service and Urban Affairs. This comes out of a, of, a, of a rather historic and important lawsuit that was originated here, the Geyer lawsuit. In the Geyer case, uh, the, the federal courts had found uh, that the basically the same principles of Brown versus Board of Education also applied at the college level, and in particular uh, as to Tennessee State University, which had been um, both underfunded and also overreached by other higher education entities. So uh, he had the, the, the funds available to start a new College of Public Service, and he asked if I would do that when I returned from Harvard, and so I did. And so you started that school, and then you also went back to practicing law, I think, with... Uh, well, us. I did. I did. I, 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 from, from TSU, I was recruited back to Harvard to run their Institute of Politics, and so I went back up there for about uh, three years total. Uh, but... Uh, then I was ready. I was I was ready to come home. Uh, I felt like my work there was done, and uh, and and I kept my house and my wife was still here and the same uh, anyway neighborhood. And I I was ready. And so I came home and 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 here was the Nashville bar, uh, as before. Uh, the, the lawyers, thankfully, had been were well preserved by the practice. They were most all of them in in place. Uh, I came to practice with my old law partner, Bill Farmer, uh, who was now in practice with his son, Jonathan Farmer, and, and uh, some others. And so I came into this building where the NBA is now uh, and went into practice uh, and began to develop a public policy practice, uh, which, uh, again, uh, one of the great joys of being a lawyer is that you have the ability at different times in life to, to pivot, if you might, or want to. Uh, so I got to do more public policy, I, I, I realized I was not any longer uh, equipped by experience to go back into the criminal courts, and, and my experiences in family law were quite long remote. But I, uh, I did feel as though I had something to contribute on the public policy side, and so I've been blessed to be first in my own firm and now more recently as counsel to a large regional firm that has, over the last 10 years, come to find Nashville as being one of the great markets yeah. uh, in the country. Frost Brown Todd from Louisville and Cincinnati, but they see a large and important part of the future. We look up, other law firms are coming from all around. Well, has, your firm has a, quite a large growing presence in Nashville, too. We do. And, and, and that's another sign. When, when, you know, we, yes, corporate headquarters, yes, factories, yes, uh, music industry, health care, uh, automotive, lots of different things here now. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I'm not sure all the law firms would agree with what I'm going to say, but I will say, from a public policy perspective, it's a pretty good sign when the law firms of America think they need to be in Nashville right. too. Yeah. Because that tells you that it's now universally understood. This city is a city on the rise that is, I think, in agreement about the fundamental things a city has to do. And there's every reason to think that that will, that will be true over time. 
Well, you certainly had a great impact on not just Nashville, although a huge impact there, but also the state when you were working in the legislature. Um, I'd kind of like to wrap up with you telling us um, who um, are the what person or persons were had the biggest influence on you in your practice of law? You know, that's one of the one of the great and important questions, I suppose, in in life. Uh, and the the nice thing about your interview, Jimmy Lynn, is that you have you've given me a chance to to mention those people already. I think, uh, no question. I think, like most of us, my parents and my mother in particular, her belief that uh, that. Uh, you could, through your own persuasive uh, efforts, be uh, of, of value to people and to issues. Uh, certainly, uh, my father, in, in, in his commitment to, to fair and honest dealing with in, in business and the, and the way in which he approached life in that effect. Uh, my Uncle John Reed, who, uh, who helped me understand the things that we described already and, and remained uh, staunchly my uh, consultant on matters of law from a distance. Uh, and then um, uh, Walter Kurtz, who for not just me, and I think for you and for so many other people, he was a candidate for public defender who came not from a machine or a family or all of which one can, can, can uh, find good things uh, about, but came simply out of the bar and out of a group of people who thought we can do better and different. And he was elected public defender and then elected judge. And then in that process, went, looked out and brought lawyers into, into a place that we'd never had full-time public defenders. We'd never had full-time criminal offense on the public side, just had, had not existed here. Walter Kurtz did that uh, and, and in the process was transformative to the judicial system and, uh, and obviously uh, to me. Uh, so I, I, I give him a lot of credit for both showing us how you could change uh, public policy on the ground in the city of Nashville, but also how you could change political reality in Nashville by, the, by, by combined and, and shared work. And lastly, I'd have to say that um, we've, been, we've been truly blessed in Nashville to have a criminal and civil justice system uh, that across time has been among, I think, the, the, the most honest and honorable, informed and, and committed to justice of any city in the country. If there, if there is a secret of our success as a city, and, and, and I think there is, it would be that, that thing that we in Nashville have over time, and I mean over a long time, had among the best judges, prosecutors, uh, in the end, defenders. We've had a, a system that, 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 the, that the voters and the people of Nashville insisted be among the best in the country and as good as we could possibly have. And that, 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 that assertion, that, that, uh, that uh, commitment to and understanding about justice in the place, I think is a bedrock principle of the success of this or any other city. You can look around the country, and you can look here and find moments in time in our legislature, in our city government, in places, of course. There have been moments when we, when we failed. Sometimes one of us failed, sometimes more. But each of those cases, the, 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 the system of justice, which is at the core, made up of lawyers and, and, and laws, has responded in a way that lifted us back up again. And, and so... Uh, maybe in conclusion, uh, if you're if you're a mayor, you can do many things, and I've said that. Uh, but one of the things that probably wouldn't occur to anyone but a mayor uh, is that you you get to not only encourage the construction of buildings, but you can have some effect on the buildings themselves. And so, one of the things that I hope people will remember is the uh, in the creation of the new criminal courts building I had the opportunity to choose the words that would go on the front of the building and they are there now and they are important enough that they are there twice and they say and these are words from Alexander Hamilton I believe they say the first duty of society is justice it is it's true 
the good news about Nashville is because of the Nashville Bar and because of the lawyers of this state, but especially the people here, I think that is understood. I think that is believed. I think the, 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 um, the, the, the evidence is right there in our courthouse today, and it is essential that it, it always is. And my hope is it always will be. Wow, Bill, that's uh, an incredible way to end. Uh, you certainly have done uh, I, just a, an incredible amount of work to bring justice to our city and, and to the state. And um, I think we're ending on a high note here. I appreciate the time to sit down and talk with you. And uh, I know many people who watch this interview will find it inspiring. Uh, you've had a great long history of public service and certainly your career is not over you just enter new career new uh, new aspects all the time so thank you for being with us today thank you jimmy lynn thanks for your leadership in the bar and thanks for your time 